Hi, and welcome back to our conversation about the immune system. Today, we're going to start a two-part conversation about what happens when the immune system doesn't behave appropriately. These are referred to collectively as diseases of the immune system. Now, this can occur in two different ways. One is what happens when the immune system is hyperactive or hypersensitive. This is what happens when the immune system essentially overreacts. The other way, which we're going to talk about today, are referred to as immunodeficiencies. This is what happens when the immune system essentially underreacts. In other words, the immune system isn't quite strong enough for one reason or another to help fend off infections like a normal immune system does. So stay tuned today while we talk about what happens when our immune system underreacts to an invasion. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. As I mentioned in the intro, today we're talking about immunodeficiencies. So immunodeficiencies are what happens when the immune system, for one reason or another, has become weakened. Now, immunodeficiencies come in two different varieties, primary and secondary. The easiest way to distinguish between these are that primary immunodeficiencies are going to be those with which you are born. Secondary immunodeficiencies are one that you will acquire through your life experiences. And we'll talk about each of those in turn. Let's begin by talking about primary immunodeficiencies. So there are roughly 200 different primary immunodeficiencies that have been identified. And of those, about 60% of those approximately involve B cells. In other words, issues that impact B cells. Now, primary immunodeficiencies could actually affect all different kinds of cells in the immune system. So in, in what type of cell they impact also influences what tissues and which type of diseases a person becomes more susceptible to. So for example, uh, immunodeficiencies that impact T cells primarily are going to impact the ability of an individual to respond to bacterial infections, uh, as well as viral infections, and parasitic infections and fungal infections because they will essentially be unable to mount a T-cell mediated response, which can impact other branches of the immune system as well. On the other hand, an immunodeficiency that specifically impacts the B cells is more likely to damage the person's ability to respond to bacterial infections, predominantly encapsulated ones and those that infect the, it, attack the GI tract, but they also seem to have struggle, they also seem to struggle with many viral infections. If somebody has an immunodeficiency that targets either uh, your phagocytes or it impacts, it impacts the complement system, that's going to be something that's more, more likely to impact their ability to react to various bacterial infections. So there is a degree of tissue specificity as well that we won't get into, but in large part, when we talk about the impact of an immunodeficiency, it's going to depend on which branch of the immune system is actually being impacted by that particular immunodeficiency. So let's start by talking about some primary immunodeficiencies that predominantly target the T cell branch of the immune system. The first one we'll talk about is something called SCID or severe combined immunodeficiency. This can happen as a result of one of a dozen mutations that have been identified and result in the de development of SCID. So the mutations either occur in either in the, either the interleukin two receptor or affect an enzyme called adenine deaminase or ADA. If the mutation that causes SCID is one that's in the IL-2 receptor, that is going to impact mainly the function of T cells, since interleukin-2 is a cytokine that's really responsible for the proliferation and activity of T cells. On the other hand, if it is a mutation that impacts adenine deaminase activity or ADA deficiency, this is a form of SCID that not only will target the T cells, but it will also target the B cells as well as the natural killer cells. The main reason behind this is because ADA is an enzyme that is required in order for the uh, for cells to develop in order to, for cells to divide and since the lymphocyte branch of cells is one of the most predominantly active in terms of mitotic cell division particularly in response to an immune attack these cells are particularly affected someone with adenine deaminase deficiency is someone that's going to neither produce t-cells nor b-cells nor natural killer cells regardless an individual with SCID is someone that is going to be prone to uh, dying bef with before six months of age after repeated uh, and recurrent infections unless they are provided proper treatment. Treatment for SCID uh, involves s often removing people from an environment where they could become infected since they have such a weak immune system. They can also be treated with IV immunoglobulin therapy as well as uh, ADA enzyme replacement if it is an ADA deficiency that is the cause of the SCID. The second 
T cell targeting immunodeficiency is that we'll talk about is something called the George syndrome. So the George syndrome occurs when somebody is born either missing a part of or the entirety of their thymus. And as you recall, the thymus is essential for the development of T cells. It's where they go to mature, receive their T cell receptors, and so on and so forth. Uh, the extent to which the disease is problematic has to do with the amount of the thymus that's missing. So somebody who's missing only part of their thymus will have less of an impact on them if they're missing the entirety of their thymus. Now, someone who is missing their, uh, all of their thymus uh, is likely to die very early on. This is not really compatible with life since you will need T-cells in order to survive. The treatment for this is largely going to be tissue replacement. So you're going to have to replace that thymus, uh, that thymus tissue in order to restore the activity of it. The last one we'll talk about in terms of T-cell immunodeficiencies is something called MHC2 deficiency. This occurs when a mutation impacts the ability of a, of a person's antigen-presenting cells from being able to properly produce class 2 MHC receptors. If you recall, MHC2s are the ones that are needed to present antigen in order to activate helper T-cells. And without proper helper T-cell activity, uh, it becomes very challenging for the body to mount a full-blown immune response in response to an invasion. So people that have class 2 MHC2 deficiencies, uh, these are individuals that are going to be susceptible to a wide range of infections throughout their lifetime. Next, we'll move on to B cell disorders or disorders that are going to specifically target the B cell lineage. The first one we'll talk about is something called X-linked A gamma globulinemia. In other words, these are people who are going to, through a mutation, they're going to be unable to actually properly produce immunoglobulins. As a result, if you recall, immunoglobulins are the genes that, in, or immunoglobulins are the proteins that are needed to form antibodies as well as T cell and B cell receptors. Individuals who lack immunoglobulins are unable to produce uh, antibodies and as a result have a very poor antibody response. Uh, they are susceptible to a broad range of infections. They're particularly susceptible to encapsulated bacterial infections. As you know, um, encapsulated bacteria are, are very tricky for your body to target and antibodies are our best weapon against them. People that have this are often treated with uh, IV immunoglobulin therapy, so they're going to replace the immunoglobulins uh, with, with synthetic ones or ones derived from uh, another source to help them fight off the infection. Another immunodeficiency that specifically targets B cells is something called common variable immunodeficiency. So this is what happens, and we believe it's the result of mutations that impact uh, various CD receptors on the surface of B cells. What ends up happening here is these cells fail to differentiate into plasma B cells. In other words, they don't produce the B cell lineage that's able to properly produce antibodies. Now, depending on the mutation, uh, that will it will impact the person in different ways. So some patients that suffer from combined variable immunodeficiencies produce almost no antibodies whatsoever. Other patients suffering from so from common variable immunodeficiencies produce one class of antibodies but lack others or just some of some classes of antibodies but still don't produce others uh, the replacement or the treatment for this is often um, intravenous uh, immunoglobulin so IVIG uh, to help replace those immunoglobulins that their body is unable to produce as well as frequent antibiotic usage to help treat off any infections that they might be exposed to they are of course susceptible to a wide range of infections particularly those that of encapsulated bacteria and those that impact the respiratory and the gastrointestinal tract the next two B cell immunodeficiencies refer to what happens when a specific class of antibodies is either overrepresented or underrepresented or missing. So the first one's called hyper IgM syndrome. So if you recall, hyper I our IgM antibodies are the first class of antibodies that get produced. They're particularly adept at opsonizing bacteria, uh, opsonizing bacteria, and and doing something called complement fixation. But what happens in most cases is through the influence of those follicular helper T cells, those B cells go through a process of class switching and change the production of other antibody classes that are needed in response to certain infections, since IgMs aren't always the best in order to fight off all infections. But these particular individuals have a mutation that interrupts CD40 signaling. So if you remember, CD40 is that co-stimulatory signal. And that's also the way in which uh, T cells are able to influence which type of of antibodies should be produced by a given B cell. As a result, individuals produce an, an enormous amount of IgM antibodies while failing to produce other, uh, I, other antibody classes such as IgG and IgA. So if you look at their antibody profile, you'll see tons of IgMs, hence hyper IgM, but they'll be almost complete, but you'll find IgGs and IgAs are almost completely absent in this particular individual because of this defect in their inability to class switch.
The last one we'll talk about is something called selective IgA deficiency. So these individuals have the inability to, to class switch to IgA antibodies. Now the interesting part about this is unlike many of the other immunodeficiencies we spoke about, somewhere between 85 and 90% of people with selective IgA deficiency are asymptomatic. And this is particularly interesting because IgA antibodies are the most common form of antibody in the body because remember, they guard the mucous membranes and the gastrointestinal tract. Now, some individuals do present with recurrent infections in the, in the uh, respiratory tract as well as the gastrointestinal tract where those IgA antibodies are needed. But like I said, somewhere between 85 and 90% of people that suffer from this will never even know they suffer from it because they don't have any outward symptoms. The reasons behind this are actually quite controversial and it's unknown why IgA, why these individuals who lack IgA antibodies for the most part aren't affected by this. So that covers primary immunodeficiencies. What about secondary immunodeficiencies? Well, secondary immunodeficiencies are those that have to that you acquire through your life experience. Now, some of them are fairly obvious. So for example, if you happen to be a person who is living with AIDS or a person who has another type of, of disease that may impact their ability to fight off infections, such as cancers um, or undergoing chemotherapy, this is pretty uh, understandable why you would have an immunodeficiency. Other things that can impact your ability to respond to an infection and render you either temporarily or permanently immunodeficient are, for example, your age. So being very young or being very old can also constitute immunodeficiency. Very young individuals between less than two years of age and very old individuals, particularly those that are already in poor health, are much more susceptible to infections simply because the body doesn't have the capability of producing the immune response that you do when you're in more of your, when, when you're in of those middle ages, somewhere between two and, and 80, for example. Another thing that can impact you and count as a secondary immune deficiency is being pregnant. So one of the things that happens in pregnant women actually is their immune system kind of tunes itself down a little bit. One of the reasons for this is quite simply because there's now another human being living inside of you. And the last thing that that evolution would want and the last thing that you should want is your body mounting an immune response against the fetus or fetuses that are inside of your body. So women who are uh, pregnant are, are much more likely to become infected with diseases. The good news is, is your body is not only going to produce antibodies for the most part that will protect you from those diseases, but they will also produce antibodies that will protect the fetus uh, and the, de the developing baby from those diseases as well. A couple other things that can count as secondary immunodeficiencies, uh, just being sick in general. So one of the things that's quite common are what we call secondary infections. So these are infections that happen following a previous infection. So let's say you have a cold, now you're much more susceptible to other diseases because your immune system's already busy fighting off another infection and may not have the capacity to fight off subsequent infections at that point. Other things such as stress and lack of sleep can also, can also lead to uh, the, a, a decrease in your ability to respond to infections. One of the things that happens, for example, when you're stressed out is your body produces stress hormones, things like cortisol. And one of the things we know about cortisol is that can actually act to tamp down your immune response, which is why if you're stressed out or you're not getting enough sleep, you're much more susceptible to diseases because your body's already stressed out due to those two things. The last thing we'll talk about in this, in this video is going to be lymphoid cancers. So one of the things that I mentioned before is that your lymphatic system is probably the one that divides, has more cell division than any other system in your body. As a result of the high levels of cell division, there's also a great deal of surveillance that has to happen. And what that means is your, your body has to constantly be on the lookout for lymphoid cells that are improper or could potentially be cancerous. So there's a good deal of surveillance that happens. This, is, this largely has to do with uh, the ability of cells that are abnormal or cancerous to produce abnormal proteins and carbohydrates. They put abnormal surface molecules out there that can actually act as signals for other cells to come along and destroy them so that we don't develop something called lymphoid cancers. Now there are four common types of lymphoid cancers and I'm not gonna go over many examples. I'm just gonna go over these four classes briefly so that you're able to distinguish between the four of them. The first one is what is called a lymphoma, and this is the most common form of lymphatic cancer. So lymphoma occurs when you have a solid mass or solid masses when in one or more lymph nodes. So you actually notice swelling of those lymph nodes as that mass grows. So essentially these are lymphoid tumors. Contrast that with leukemia. So leukemia is what happens when you have malignant uh, cells circulating either within the body or found within a lymphoid organ. So these are not going to be tumors, but they're going to be uh, cancerous uh, lymphatic cells that haven't formed a tumor but are now circulating in the body. 
The third type of lymphoid cancer is called plasmocytoma. So plasmocytoma is what happens when you have malignant plasma B cells uh, that are forming a tumor in one of the one typically in the bone marrow. Uh, but there are also ones that occur outside of the bone, but it's a single solitary tumor caused by cancerous plasma B cells. The other one is referred to as multiple myeloma. So the fourth one is multiple myeloma. And this is what happens when you have multiple uh, plasma, uh, plasma B cell tumors growing in several different parts of the body. Uh, this is actually an incredibly, uh, incredibly painful form of cancer that's typically only found in individuals greater than 65 years of age. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. Today we discussed immunodeficiencies or what happens when the body is unable to respond appropriately to an invasion for one reason or another. In our next video, we'll tackle hypersensitivities. And this is what happens when our immune systems are actually too powerful or they respond too strongly. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you guys are learning a lot and I'll see you guys next time.